Mariners fans, it is game day. It is time for game one of the ALDS for the Astros versus Mariners and Mariners fans. You have been waiting, what, 21 years for this. So this is probably a, this is probably a holiday for y'all. Um, I know Astros were probably spoiled. We've been going to the playoffs for a while here, but I know this is something special for you. And we have Ty Dane Gonzalez joining us on the Locked on Astros podcast. And we'll discuss this and more on this episode of the Locked on Astros and Locked on Mariners podcast. Hello and welcome to Locked on Astros, your daily Astros podcast. Here are your hosts, Eric the Man Heisman and Brett H-Town Wheelhouse Chansey. We are Locked On Houston Astros, and we hope that you join us for a daily Locked On Astros podcast. My name is Eric Heisman. You can find me on Twitter at Eric Talk Stros. Find the show at Locked On Astros, your team every day. Brett, where can it find you at? They can find me at H-Town Wheelhouse on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, and at Stros411 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Always positive. Positive. I love this AL West matchup. Always Stros. And Ty, I'm going to go ahead and let you do your intro for your audio, but um, thank you for coming on the show, and go ahead and do your intro. Yeah, appreciate you uh, having me on, and uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, if you're listening on the uh, Locked On Mariners podcast version of this, uh, thank you for making us your first listen. My name is Ty Dane Gonzalez, as always, uh, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dane Gonzalez, C-A-N-E-G-N-Z-L-Z, and you can find the show at LO underscore Mariners on Twitter. So, yeah, let's get into this thing. I'm really excited about this. All right, guys. So thank you for making Locked on Astros podcast your first listen as well. I'm sure you, if you're a Mariners fan, you'll listen to this guy. But if you're Astros fan, you'll be tuning in to us all uh, postseason as we, we got you covered. And make sure you keep on subscribing to us on YouTube. Uh, we're almost close to – we're really close to the 5,000 mark. I believe we're like, what, 94 away. So keep on subscribing yeah. to us on YouTube. Make sure you listen to us on Apple, Odyssey, Spotify. And if you want to listen to the, the guy below and his uh, his partner, uh, Kobe, right? Um, yeah, then you Kobe, could do yeah. so. Yeah, you could do so as well. So we've got a lot to talk about. I know that there's a li- little bit of bad blood between the two teams. And there's a little <laughs> bit of a, uh incident earlier this year. And I know that uh, there's been a lot of uh, controversy with the manager, Scott Service. We don't want to go too much into that about uh, what's going on there. But uh, this is definitely a up and coming team, the Mariners. And I, I'm excited to see what this team can do. It's a young team. It does have some veterans like Luis Castillo. He he adds so much validity to your pitching staff that was already so much better. And then you have some of the bats like Julio Rodriguez. I'm, I'm sure y'all thought he was going to be good. But I didn't think y'all, y'all probably didn't know he would be so good so quickly. So um, what are your overall thoughts of the Mariners 2022 season? Uh, these guys, they play their absolute hearts out. It's been a blast watching them. I mean, you know, if anything, them winning that series against the Blue Jays, I'm just grateful for another opportunity to watch the Mariners baseball for the next week because uh, this team is just it's been a lot of fun. The journey that they've taken us all on, it's been great. Uh, and this team, you know, they, they have, they have the pieces, they have the pieces, they, they, they have, you know, they're not a great offense, but they have, you know, obviously a budding superstar in Julio Rodriguez. They have Ty France, they have Mitch Hanniger, they have uh, Cal Raleigh, who's been fantastic guys that can do some damage in that lineup. And then of course that pitching staff, this is one of the best bullpens in baseball, if not the best bullpen in baseball and one of the best starting rotations in baseball as well with the addition of Luis Castillo, the rise of George Kirby, uh, Logan Gilbert's uh, been really really solid in his second year. Robbie Ray, of course, has taken a step back, but he's had some really great moments this season as well. And so, you know, it's been, it's just, a, it's a really, really fun team that's on the rise and uh, is only going to get better over the next few years. So it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, Ty, I just want to say this. I just want to compliment you guys. I do drop in on y'all show from time to time and I love which you guys offer to the Mariners fans. I know you guys were kind of a little bit of seasoned veterans as y'all came over to the Locked On Network. Y'all done a phenomenal job. Y'all been knocking it out. And, you know, Julio Appreciate Rodriguez, it. and you're welcome. Um, him and Jeremy Pena were kind of one and 1A one or one and two. You know, it seemed like, you know, there for a while, Jeremy Pena had a little bit of a drop-off. But I know right now that um, 
the Mariners have a focus on, you know, throwing the fastball. Um, but we know Logan Gilbert, if his slider's working, it's deadly. Um, the playoffs, I think you attack differently than the regular season. A, you have a lot less time to do it in, and you have fewer opportunities. So when you get an opportunity to come against a Jose Altuve, and you know he hits a slider, you know he, you know, actually, or Aldis Chapman wouldn't throw him fastballs for two reasons. His fastball wasn't locating, and Jose Altuve murders fastballs. But he threw him that slider, that famous took it out of the park, walk off the game. Going into this, so someone like Logan Gilbert, your third pitcher in your lineup, Julio Castillo is obviously your ace, your number one, Robbie Ray, then Logan Gilbert, I think a seniority thing. But what does Gilbert offer for the Mariners to the Astros hitters that maybe Astros fans may not be aware of? I mean, other than his imposing six foot six frame. Yeah, well, and along with that, he has elite extension. You know, he gets closer to the plate than anyone does when he, you know, throws uh, throws the ball. And so, you know, the big thing for him is going to be fastball command. Is he able to keep the fastball in the zone? Because if he doesn't have the fastball, he's cooked. Because he really has struggled in establishing a secondary and a tertiary pitch. The changeup was really working for him in September, and September was a great month for him. And that's going to be a, a huge pitch for him in attacking guys like Kyle Tucker and Jordan Alvarez, those lefties that, you know, you got to have something that breaks away from those guys. And the other thing, you know, like you mentioned, is, is the slider, right? He's got to be able to throw the slider effectively. He's got, again, he's got to have something secondary or tertiary to go along with that fastball because we've seen him when he only has the fastball and when, you know, he only can trust throwing the fastball despite not having the command with it. And it's not great. It's not great. It, it, it's very easily for him to blow up. And we've seen him struggle at Minute Maid Park in the past, uh, specifically in his rookie season. This year, it's been a bit better. I think he's rocking a, a 3.75 ERA at Minute Maid uh, through uh, two games this year. But yeah, it all comes down to that fastball and being able to establish a secondary and a tertiary. Um, but I'm curious what you guys think about Justin Verlander in this game. And more specifically, I want to ask you guys about, you know, this is a new format. We've never really seen uh, a team get a full bye week before playing again. So what do you think about this start, this stop and start stuff? And how do you think the Astros are going to respond to that? Well, I know that the Astros did a, I don't want to call it a simulated game, but they did have some their pitchers facing some batters. Like they had Ryan Presley face uh, Jose Altuve and he struck him out. And so you had some situations like that. You, they had like um, workouts every morning for the most part, except for the, after the last game of the season. So they tried to stay loose, but at the same time, it's not the same time as being in game a action. So Justin Verlander pitched in his last game on that. I believe it was that Tuesday of the um, versus the Phillies. That was his last time he pitched. So yeah, there's going to be a little bit of a delay from when he pitched. So about a week actually. So if you think about it, a week, uh, seven days. So yeah, that's a little bit more than what he's used to. But actually this year, the Astros have done that to him. They've kind of stretched his um, time out between starts to kind of save his arm for the situation. So I think that he probably threw in between uh, starts and I think that he'll be fine. He's a veteran. He's done this before. So I'm not worried about him. And uh, he's actually pitched really good against the uh, Mariners this year and if you're looking at the guy who's crushed him most that would be Carlos Santana with a 19 uh, and he's 19 for 84 against him in his career with the 226 bang average with nine home runs uh, Julio yeah. Rodriguez is four for 16 in his um, short career uh, batting 250 with the 750 OPS with one home run and Ty France is a guy that's hitting good against him um, seven for 20 with the 315 batting average with one home run and a 900 OPS. So there are some guys that can hit Verlander uh, in this lineup, but what Verlander's good at is he's good at spreading those hits out. So they're not back to back and getting those key outs. Brett. Yeah. I think his key is um, Verlander has relied heavily on the breaking pitches this year. 
And I think that plays to Seattle's weakness. They're a great fastball hitting team. They struggle against the breaking pitches. And someone like Verlander, I believe, with his veteran arm, with his mind, with with what he's worked through, I think a veteran like Justin Verlander facing a team more times than not benefits them because they're able to figure out the chess side of it. Where uh, I see a Logan Gilbert more, you know, being more prone to struggle. Now, that doesn't mean that's going to happen. I mean, go look at the Mets series. What the heck? Like, you have Scherzer and DeGrom and Bassett, and you think, oh, well, uh, that's that's easy. You know, Padres lose. They get Juan Soto. It's a failure, blah, blah, blah. And then baseball happens. So the Astros absolutely have to come out. And, and Ty, just so you know on this show, and just so it's chronicled, so so we have proof of it, we have not said, hey, the Astros, this is a this is a dead ringer. We've got this. It's in the bag. Seattle comes hot. Seattle comes in knowing us. Um, top to bottom, I think if the Astros take care of business, that I'm not worried about the results that come out, whether it's four or five games or whatever happens. But Seattle isn't just going to come in here and lay a goose egg. We saw that in that game where y'all came back in that eight to one. Gossman walks off the mound. You think, okay, we're going to game three, whatever. And I don't know if there's a fan in that stadium, whether they were for the Mariners or the Blue Jays, that assumed that that comeback was going to happen. But to get back to as, Justin Verlander, as, as oh, someone that was ahead. in, as someone that was in that stadium, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Oh. I didn't think that was happening. <laughs> were Were you there? Yeah, so I live here. I live in I live uh, in the Toronto area. So you they know came what? here. It was perfect. <laughs> wow, I did not know that. That is awesome. That's that's a good yep. tidbit there. But I think with Justin Verlander's breaking pitches and with his understanding of the game overall, I think it's a huge advantage. And I think there's more room for error when it comes to Logan Gilbert because of his age. But I will say this. Seattle, for all intents and purposes, when they started catching us and then they fell back, like there was a time when I was like, man, Seattle might, they might not make it into the playoffs. And then all of a sudden they caught fire. And it looks like this AOS division for the next couple of years is going to be Astros, Mariners, and really nobody else. It's basically, it should be a two team division, really, to be honest. And the other guys are just participants. Yeah, I, I think we're seeing the start of a, a really, really fun rivalry. And I mean, we've seen, you know, some of the contentious stuff as well. And I, I think, you know, we're, we've already kind of seen that start. And this is I, I think this is all going to kind of come to a head here with I mean, this is high stakes baseball. This is what this is what you want. This is what you want. Yeah, so um, if you're looking at the odds, I know uh, Brett said that we're not looking at, uh, as Astros fans, we're not thinking this is cakewalk, but uh, what do you think Bet Online is saying? So let's talk about what Bet Online is saying the odds are. So according to Bet Online, the Seattle Mariners are plus 200 to win the series, and the Astros are negative 240 to win the series. And the Astros are the second. Uh, have the second best odds of winning the World Series. So guys, if you want more odds like this, go to Bet Online. It's your number one source for football betting info this season and playoff baseball. Find all of the latest f- player development, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and article and analysis of every game you can find. And as always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sports game out there the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events including mlb mma boxing and golf head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more bet online it's where the game starts all right so let's take a look at those numbers guys um do y'all agree those numbers is um that well look here's the deal i will i will acquiesce to this because like i said i have been asked um, oh, Matt Thomas, you're not Matt Thomas. You're a Ty Gonzalez. I almost called you Matt too. Ty, I've been asked by several of our listeners, please don't predict because they think that every time I predict something, it doesn't do you, true. Brett. Do you, Brett? <laughs> no, yeah, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do me because the second I predict something, it doesn't happen. No, I'm not gonna do that. Look, if the players aren't gonna predict anything, I'm not gonna predict anything. I think that's a smart choice, but I, I just, I, I like that these teams are so evenly matched and let me tell you how much respect this series is getting. And I'm not talking about the time slot. Okay. Cause that's a whole money thing. Everybody's saying that the winner of this 
game or of this series is going to go on to the World Series. They say the winner of the Seattle Houston series is going to take out whoever come out of the Guardians and Yankees series. And for Mariners fans, that's a huge nod of respect to you guys because that means people are overlooking the Yankees and looking at this as really the true ALCS. Well, and I kind of agree with that because I think if the Mariners end up beating the Astros and it doesn't really matter how, how that looks, this is kind of a team of destiny, don't you think? You know, you, you go into Toronto, which is a hell of a, of a atmosphere there, and you take both games and, you know, you have that insane comeback. And then to go up against essentially the team that's been your big brother for the last few years and go into Houston. I mean, you're going to have to beat Justin Verlander at least once to, to win that series. So if they do that, I mean, and look, they've handled the, the guardians very well. They won their uh, season series with the Yankees. I'm not really concerned about those two teams. Like if, if you can beat the Astros, you can beat anyone in my mind there. The Astros are by and far the, the best team in the American league. And then, like, there's a pretty steep cliff, and then there's the Yankees, there's the Mariners, there's the Blue Jays. Like, that's how, that's how I've always felt about it, and I'm sure Mariners fans are, are going to get upset with me for saying that, but <laughs> the Astros are really good. The Astros are really good. I'm just going to be real about it. The Astros are really good, and so if they're able to, uh, the Mariners are able to, to, to win this series, yeah, I think the sky's the limit. And, yes, let's talk about those Mariners shirts. I want to, I, I, wanna, I actually wanted, I wanted, I wanted to, to make a point. I'm yeah, I want to I wanted to make a point of uh, so I I made a point to to acknowledge this first even before anyone left a comment here on the show, um, yes. Yeah, so that those were made by a company named Simply Seattle, and I, I I respect the hell out of Simply Seattle. They're they're a great company that has a lot of great gear. If you're a Mariners fan, Sonics fan, Seahawks fan, whatever, it's great. They're making a little too many shirts over there. Ever since like the drought ended, I think I've seen like 15 new shirt designs coming out of them. And uh, yeah, I can speak for a lot of the folks on Mariners Twitter in that yeah that the Houston we have a problem or you have a problem shirts. Uh, we don't we don't own that. We don't own that. We don't back that. Real ones don't back that. We we don't. Well, okay. That. So <laughs> so so here's what one fan and. I'll give her credit. Um, someone from Astros Twitter, her name is Michelle Neat. She she basically articulated this. She said, it says, Houston, we are a problem. Actually, a more definitive statement would be, we are the problem. Almost like there, we have all these problems, but really, should we worry about you? And is that a you rocket? You got 99 what? problems, but you ain't one. <laughs> well, here's the thing. And look, I didn't mean to do this, okay? I didn't I didn't put any bad juju on this, but the second I retweeted it, I said, does H-Town make shirts about opposing teams in the, in the divisional series? And guess what happened? A t-shirt bot popped up. The third reply was, buy your t-shirt here. So, hey, um, I just was like, oh, karma's a you-know-what, but... You know, I just wanted to ask you about that because, look, here's here here's the thing. I agree with Sully. A lot of times the Astros take it on the chin, but when you go back and forth with fans, if you can argue and you can go back and forth, and it's not about players getting hurt, and it's not malicious, it's fun. It's called sports, and that's what makes our sports world go round. I want a highly contested series. I think the Astros can make easy work of it, but I also think the Astros can make it look easy while the Seattle Mariners also disrupt that process and really put a hurt in a couple innings and go, whoa. But one thing I like about the Astros, and Ty, let me ask you if you think this is a factor, is their experience. That is the one thing that the Houston Astros offer that may be one other team can offer, but the Astros playoff experience and Jose Altuve being four home runs away from the all time tying the all time postseason six. record for home runs. Oh, I'm six. sorry, six home runs away. Sorry, I keep getting that wrong. Mm. Yeah, he's six home runs away from that, right? Like, as a Mariners fan, does that concern you knowing how much experience Houston brings to the table? I mean, experience is certainly a, a factor. Uh, and, and it's going to be certainly when you're when you're talking about a very young team and a very inexperienced team like the Mariners. Um, and, and that certainly gives the Astros the, the upper hand in this. But the thing that I'll say about the Mariners on that front, what they did in Toronto, it didn't seem like they were phased by the moment at all. 
it seemed like they just did not care whatsoever that this was the postseason. I mean, they had a rookie pitcher in George Kirby close out a one-run game in an elimination game, and it was fine. It went fine. Like, that's just kind of the mentality of this team. And even when they get down 8-1 and the entire crowd is chanting at Robbie Ray, Robbie, Robbie, and it feels like you already lost the game in the fourth inning, they didn't care. They did not care. They did not blink, right? And so that's the thing that we've seen all season long. And it didn't matter who they played. And obviously they lost their season series with the Astros, but they've beat a lot of really good teams. They've won their season series against a lot of good teams. And what they, again, what they did in Toronto was incredibly impressive for such a young team and for such a hostile environment. And it's going to be really interesting to see how that continues here in Houston. And more importantly, how that continues once they get back to Seattle. Cause again, that's the first playoff game in Seattle in 21 years. There's a lot there's like no matter if if even if the Astros are up 2-0 going into that game, that's gonna oh, be it's... an electric that's gonna be an electric scene. Yeah. Uh, so like I mentioned in yesterday's podcast, Jose Altuve is tied for fourth overall with 79 playoff games. So that experience does uh play into the situation. Uh he doesn't get rattled and everything. But to the contrary of that is look what the Guardians did. Yes, it was only two games, but they were the youngest team in the playoffs. And uh, they beat um, the Rays. The Rays are an experienced team that um, has gone deep into playoffs before. So um, young, just because you have experience doesn't mean you got to go out there and play baseball. And the Astros won seven of the games with uh, this year versus Mariners with three or fewer runs. So it's going to be a tough matchup, but I just think that the Astros – if we've looked at all the the, the uh, series so far, pitching seems to win. The team that has the best pitching and gets enough offense, they seem to win. So I just think that the Astros have the best pitching staff out there. They have the best bullpen. Seattle's pretty good. It's like right behind the Astros. The, Ast- the Mariners rotation is right behind the Astros. The only question mark I would have about the Astros is the lineup. And Dusty Baker came out today, and uh, we've been having this discussion about Mauricio Dubon. Is he could be starting in center field uh, because he is Justin Verlander's personal center fielder because he's got a good arm. But he kind of squashed that bug today and said that, uh, no, I don't think we're going to do that. We want more offense. And so they're probably going to put Chaz McCormick out there, meaning you're probably going to have uh, Jordan Alvarez in left field meaning you're probably going to have Trey Mancini at first base because I think the Astros view Aled Miz Diaz at, um, as a like pinch hitter off the bench. He's a very valuable weapon in that situation. So, But they can also put Jake Myers there. So the Astros' one weakness, I would say, I mean, two weaknesses, I would say, is the catching situation. But you don't really need the catching to really hit. But we got to get more offense in the playoffs uh, from the center field position. Um, so, Ty, what would you say your weakness is in your lineup? <laughs> it can be anything, and it really has been anything this year. Uh, there's been stretches throughout the entire year where the entire lineup is, is slumping, it feels. Um, so that could certainly happen here. I mean, it, it's the bottom of the lineup. Uh, right now and and, and specifically in in left field with uh, Jared Kelnick Um, he's uh, still got a lot of swing and miss he's looked better ish since he came up Uh, but that's a spot where they uh, they're basically rotating Kelnick and Dylan Moore and both of those guys are not particularly great hitters (laughs) so to put it nicely at least Demo against right-handed pitching is not great against left-handed pitching pretty good uh but yeah so that's kind of where i would look in the lineup uh in terms of a, of a weakness but right now they got a lot of guys who are cooking adam frazier was a big part of that series carlos santana was a big part of that series in toronto so uh but yeah that that kelnick more spot is a little little funky uh but overall i you know i think the big weakness is or the big question mark rather for this team is the starting pitching outside of Luis Castillo. 
you know, because again, for all the reasons that I, I laid out for uh, Logan Gilbert, you know, and how that could go really either way. Robbie Ray's also really struggled as of late. George Kirby is starting to tire out a little bit, it seems. So there, there's certainly some question marks there in terms of the pitching where I could see it completely falling off the rails. And I could also see it, you know, being incredible and, and, and shutting things down. It's just it's really a toss up with this team and it's a boomer bust team and we'll see how it goes that's just how it's been all year and it's incredibly tough to predict so uh, here's Brett, a couple Brett, real quick um i do need to correct myself i did say mancini first base i meant mancini play would play dh okay would he would he would hit dh yeah so yeah. um let me let me um let me throw in a couple things here because dusty baker was asked was asked about um you know jeremy pena being in the in the two hole and a reporter said um, what have you liked about Pena in the two hole and just the kind of pitches he's seen there? And I know since he's made the adjustment, he is hitting a lot better the last three or four weeks. Dusty Baker said, well, number one, I asked him, I asked them all at the beginning, where do they like to hit? And everybody has a preference to where they want to hit a lot of times in their life because I always bat, I always bat lead off third or fifth. I hated number four. So him batting in front of Jordan, hopefully he'll see more fastballs, which most young hitters like. Some of it is just out of necessity. Your second hitter, which I've urged him to be, which is a lot and a, a lot on the defensive side, a rookie shortstop, and a lot of the offensive side where your second hitter has to be one of your smartest hitters in your lineup. So he's really carrying a lot on his shoulders. But I think that he was one of the best when it came because him down in the lineup, he's going to see more breaking balls. So Dusty Baker sticking with his guy, Jeremy Pena. And he has full confidence in Jose Altuve leading off, Jeremy Pena going second, Jordan Alvarez going third, Bregman cleaning up. And that has just been a powerful combination. And if Gilbert's not placing his sliders out of the strike zone and Jeremy Pena is taking those pick pitches outside of the strike zone, he could get on base. And I think if an Altuve gets a single to lead off or a double and Jeremy Pena walks, then you've got Jordan Alvarez. Now all of a sudden the pressure is right on them at the get-go. So I think it's important for Pena to show up. And I believe we're going to see some unsung heroes. You're going to see guys on your side. I think we're going to see guys like Hensley, McCormick come Mm -hmm. through, Diaz, um, I even think Martin Maldonado is going to get some key hits. Martin Maldonado's hit he more home runs this year. He always does against the Mariners. He always he does against the Mariners. He loves hitting home runs. Hey, I can't wait for game three because Martin Maldonado loves to hit home runs in Seattle. Does he not? <laughs> yeah, he, he struggles against Gilbert, though. He's one for 10 in his career with a 100 batting average in OPS. Bregman's uh, had some success against Gilbert. He's seven for 17, batting 412 with one home run. Alvarez is batting 294 with the 957 OPS with one home run. And then you have a couple other guys. If you want to look at Altuve, he's four for 20 with batting 200 to 650 OPS with one home run. And then that's about it. I guess Tucker's batting 286. Yeah, he is. Um, uh, Yeah. Okay. So Ty, are you back with us? Yeah, I think so. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, All right. Apologies about that. Uh, So, yeah. So um, I would just add that, you know, for me, I think the big thing for the Mariners in this, particularly in game one, it kind of has to go like how game one in Toronto went. They have to jump on Verlander early. If they're going to get to Verlander at all, I think it has to be early. I think it has to be something like a Julio Rodriguez leadoff home run, something like that Mm. to just kind of take the edge off and get into a little bit of a zone there and and again get to an advantage where you can get to Verlander at least a little bit and then from that point forward it's going to be all about driving that pitch count up and getting into the bullpen which again you know it's a really good bullpen but I would rather face the bullpen than Justin Verlander personally speaking so you know it's kind of a pick your poison situation but I think that's going to be the key for the Mariners and they're going to have to keep things close and I envision that if if the Mariners win this game it's going to be how they've won a lot of games and that's going to be by one run and it's probably going to be like two to one if they do it so we'll see but they got to they got to start hot so would it be uh, I'm guessing game one Gilbert then Castillo then Robbie Ray in game three well, that's the that's the question, right? <laughs> so after the Robbie Ray blow up and then his uh, other rough start uh, right before that, um, 
I mean, it's it's kind of hard to, to trust him right now, but also that's your five-year, $115 million man, so you're kind of stuck in between a rock and a hard place, but me personally, I'm starting George Kirby in game three. No question about it. Without hesitation, I'm starting George Kirby. Uh, do I think they're going to do that? No. Robbie Ray is probably going to start game three, if I had to guess. They haven't announced it yet, but yes, Castillo is going in game two to answer your question. So, and we'll probably see so- him in some capacity in game five as well. If we get there, so, of course. Right. So if Lance McCullers ends up going to game two, mm-hmm. Flamber Valdez in game three, quite mm-hmm. possibly game four, Christian Javier. If you have a Valdez-Javier combo, I don't know, maybe they go back to Verlander because of off days, but what would you think in a game three for facing Framber in Seattle? And if they decided not to pitch Verlander in game four, what about Javier? What would you? I mean, do you, have you have you watched much of Christian Javier this year? Because he's had a really good year right next yeah. to Framber. Yeah, no, he's he's been fantastic. I know about Framber in the twenty five consecutive quality starts or whatever it was, I, and I know that got snapped, and he's kind of on a little bit of a miniature skid right now. But I mean, they're all good, right? Even Luis Garcia and even Urquidy. Urquidy has pitched well against the Mariners this year too. So I- again, it's a pick your poison situation. I agree with you guys. I think this is the best starting rotation in all of baseball. I mean, there's just there really isn't a, a one guy that you know. It used to be Jake or Oda Rizzi, but also Oda Rizzi was really good against the Mariners. So <laughs> you know, who, who knows? So, but like that that was about it, you know. And so there really isn't a weakness in this rotation. And again, it's just it's going to be you know it's going to come down to the Mariners being the team that they've been all year run prevention and pitching that's been their thing this year and getting you know the timely hit the timely home run that's unfortunately that's the way that their offense is built right now it's generating walks and and hitting home runs and there isn't a lot of you know moving the base pass obviously that wasn't the case on Saturday night in Toronto but that doesn't happen too often for the Mariners in general they don't generate offense like that most of the time Uh, so it's gonna you know it's gonna have to be close fairly low scoring games and we'll see how it goes so i know that um, the astros there's a lot of great playoff games in, in history but i remember game five of the 2017 world series was pretty stressful uh it was one of those games i was back and forth back and forth homer and home run and uh, that had to be what the second game of the wild card series was like I me mean, i know it wasn't back and forth but the epic comeback uh, just briefly kind of go through your emotional reaction through the whole game. You're um, just, I'm, I'm curious about this. Yeah. So again, I was there. Uh, it was mind blowing. First of all, just to say that, um, you know, I mean, just to real quick say, you know, uh, I've been living in Toronto for the last four or so years. I haven't lived in Washington state for the last 14 years. The mayors of course were in a 21 year playoff drought. And for the first postseason series for them in 21 years to end up here was like just that was mind blowing in itself to me. But yeah, during that, that comeback, I mean, you know, when it's eight to one, you're thinking, Oh, okay, it's over. Then it gets to eight to two, you know, they take Gossman out and they bring in a lefty, which goes completely against the scouting report on Carlos Santana. He's been significantly better uh, from the right side. And uh, hopefully Dusty Baker d- uh, does follow that as well. Hopefully he, uh, he, he loves what he loves what John Schneider is doing up there in Toronto. Uh, but, but yeah, you know, the Santana hits the three run home run. It's like, OK, it's a game, but also it's still like you're in Rogers Center. It's still early. The, uh, I think at that point, the, the Blue Jays had scored uh, at least one run in the last four or five innings. And so they they came back and they scored another run. Now it's nine to five. But. When it got to nine to six, and JP Crawford hits that little bloop uh, double into center field, the one that Springer unfortunately got uh, hurt on, you just knew, you just knew at that point that it was going to happen because that building went completely silent, and obviously mostly because of the injuries to right. Bichette and, and, and Springer. And you know, at that moment, you don't really celebrate, right? Because like one, you're in enemy territory, and you don't want to pop off while there's two guys down. But also, two, like you know, you're you know, I'm. I'm concerned about them. You know, I'm concerned about George Springer. That was a really nasty injury that it seemed uh, right. that, uh, he seems to sustain there. And so, you know, worried about that, but also on the inside kind of freaking out like, oh, my God, we just tied it. <laughs> and so, you know, when it was nine to nine, though, I just I knew I knew at that point this is just, again, going back to the whole team of destiny thing. That's just kind of how it's felt all year. And I don't know how far that's going to take them, but 
there was just nothing really stopping them at that point. And, you know, Adam Frazier hits the double to take the lead and eventually, you know, win the game. That was on the 27th anniversary of Edgar Martinez's double against the Yankees game five. Mm. Like, so there's a, there, there was just a lot of magic with that. Seeing all the Mariners fans that, that came out as well. Uh, the let's go Mariners chance, all that seeing, uh, you know, the team, Julio Rodriguez, Scott service, everyone interacting with the crowd and, and having a good time. Uh, it, it was just, I mean, Look, you know, it's been 20 year, 21 years. I'm 26 years old. I don't really remember the last time the Mariners were in the playoffs. Most, <laughs> mostly I remember Arthur Rhodes' earrings, and that's about it. <laughs> and so That's and so, awesome. And the so, fact that I remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, so for me, like, I just soaked that all in. I, I uh, God, just to see, like, our Mariners doing that was just, it was so cool. It was so cool. Okay, I just wanted to give you your moment once again because the Astros are going to take care of business in AL. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, here's the well, you know, he, here's the deal. One of the things I've really enjoyed about watching the Mariners play in Minute Maid Park is Julio Rodriguez. And Julio Rodriguez, in between innings when he's warming up, he always throws up the ball. He's warming up to the fans, and yeah. he'll interact with the fans and he'll point to people. He signed autographs every time he's in Houston. You know, him and Pena are actually really good friends. And um, speaking of the Mariners and their familiarity, they actually, um, you know, the Kingdom. Wow, I remember, I don't know if you probably don't remember Mark McGuire's upper deck shot in the Kingdom. You've probably I've seen, seen it. tape of it. I've seen okay. it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember when it happened. I'm a little bit older than you. But Justin Verlander said, you know, they asked him, like, obviously you've seen the Mariners a lot in your career. What is it about this team that particularly challenges you or challenges your team? He says, number one, they're really good. They present a lot of difficulties. Their pitching staff is good. Their lineup is good. They never give up. You saw that in, in Toronto. They grind out at bats. They don't make it easy. And obviously they're going to – obviously they're playing good baseball right now. So having them in is is really interesting. He said, I don't know how it plays out, but in division rival at this point of the year, you know each other so intimately – it makes it interesting. So the veterans to the rookies, to the managers, they understand the weight of the series. And you could almost say, well, Seattle has nothing to lose. And you, but you can also say, well, the Astros are expected to win. I think the pressure is maybe just on the younger, more inexperienced guys to have key moments because they don't know the moment. And what I look forward to is, I, I just i I want to see I want to see some small ball. I want to see home runs, but I want to see guys on the base pass getting gunned down. I want to see strikeouts. I, I just I, I want to see action and at the end know that the Astros did everything they could to defeat the Mariners. Obviously, I don't want the Mariners to win, but I think you guys have a few more years where you guys, like I said, are going to be contending right there alongside the Astros. Oh yeah, this is going to be a thing for a while. I hope you guys know that. Like this, this is probably not <laughs> oh, yeah. going to be the we, only we do not like the series fact, we see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we we hate the fact that Julio Rodriguez is as young as he is, and that we have to face him. Like now, thankfully, we don't have to play y'all as much in the future. <laughs> I guess I don't yeah, know. I don't. Yeah, yeah, I don't 12, know. Anything not about nineteen the games. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not twelve times games. now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Twelve times now, so we'll see how that all goes. Uh, by the way, I'm just not to get go off on a tangent. I am looking forward to that, though. I'm looking forward to seeing more teams and, uh, right. you know, just uh, being able to uh, to expose uh, fans to, to more teams, more players. I think that's a really cool idea. Yeah, and I know uh, going off what Dusty Baker is talking about, he's not ready to announce the game two starter right now. Apparently, there's some type of um, bug going around the clubhouse, and so he's not ready to announce it. Um, also, that could be a strategy thing, like they want to see how game one goes, and then they'll kind of adjust from how game one goes to see how uh, who's going to pitch in game two. But uh, there's a case to be made that McCullers – I mean, the traditional way of thinking is from or Valdez, you go righty, lefty, righty. Uh, that's what you traditionally do. But uh, if you look at McCullough's numbers, his numbers are much better at home. From or Valdez is much better on the road. So if you flip flop them, that could be a good situation. And who knows? We could see Christian Vet, uh, Javier like go in the number two. I doubt it, but um, that. Yeah, you, I don't. You could throw know, a curveball. <laughs> well, I've heard people pontificate about 
about Vest about Christian Javier in second. I don't I don't see it. No. I don't I don't see how he leapfrogs McCullers with his playoff experience, McCullers right. with how well he's been pitching. And McCullers said today on MLB Network, like he is fresh, he's feeling good. And I mean, that's what we didn't have last year, Ty. We didn't have McCullers. We didn't have Verlander. We had just lost Jake Myers. And, you know, the Braves also had people out too. And so um, you can always make excuses. But I was talking to someone today. I remember game one and game six of the World Series last year. None of those games that I feel like the Astros even had a chance in those games just because the Braves just seemed to own that moment. And that's why that game two was so pivotal for y'all because I was like, there's no way Seattle's coming back. There's no way this isn't going to third game. And I was hoping it would go three games. Y'all you know, go like 20 innings the last game. And I'd be really tired coming in to Houston, you know. <laughs> yeah, I really but, didn't want to see a repeat of the uh, Rays and Guardians game too, personally. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that 30, was, I 39 combined strikeouts, folks. 39 combined strikeouts. It's insane. <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely. I don't think anybody wants that. So uh, th- where I was going with that was outside of Verlander. Uh, I mean, I think the Astros fans, Luis Castillo is the guy that they're kind of worried about. Outside of Verlander, uh, which pitcher are, are you the most concerned about? McCullers. McCullers has eaten this lineup consistently. I I honestly can't remember a time the Mariners actually got to Lance McCullers like in a big way. You know, maybe got a couple of runs off of him, but yeah i just uh, he like if they stack verlander versus mccullers i'm very concerned about the mariners going to seattle down 2-0 um just again historically they just haven't produced at all against those guys i know mccullers is you know he's only started eight times this year and uh, there's obviously been a bunch of stuff that he's been dealing with but still really really talented Really, really talented pitcher, and uh, and you know, and then you got to deal with you, know, you got to deal with Framber or, uh, or Javier right after that. Like that's that's just that's so tough to deal with. That's unfair. It's unfair. <laughs> you had three pitchers with a hundred and yeah, eighty plus strikeouts and under a three ERA, and you had Justin Verlander who missed one three outs from getting below the. Lowest ERA mark since wild card has been instituted. He was at 1.75. Um, Pedro Martinez was at 1.74. And to see what Justin Verlander's done compares to his MVP year, his Cy Young year, and then also Jose Altuve, his numbers across the board offensively are better this year than they were in 2017 when he won the MVP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Altuve's incredible and he's such a pest to deal with and that's going to be a big one right like that's that he's going to be huge for the series Jordan's going to be huge the one guy that I I'm really focused on though is Kyle Tucker Kyle Tucker has been a guy that you know uh, obviously he he got a late start to his career but he's finally figured it out over the last couple years he's been one of the best hitters in Major League Baseball that's a guy that can do damage this is a lot of you know the Mariners have a lot of power righties uh, and that's going to be power on power. And it's going to be really interested in to see how those matchups go. Those, those are going to be big turning points, especially in that part of the lineup too. So, you know, that, that, I mean, there, there are no breaks in this lineup. There are no breaks with this pitching staff. It is a massive, massive task for this Mariners team. Uh, but again, this is the, the Mariners have, have shocked the world many a times this year. They they made a massive comeback from 29 and 39 at one point in the season. They won 14 in a row. They made an incredible comeback, one of the greatest comebacks in playoff history in Toronto with the odds stacked against them. So we have a saying in Seattle, chaos ball, it reigns supreme. Chaos ball is what the Mariners are about every single game. It's chaotic and... I'm sure it's going to be chaotic again in this series. It's, I mean, that's just the only way that the Mariners play baseball. It seems so. It's something weird's going to happen in the series, guys. Something weird is going to happen. That's that's to be guaranteed. That's not a prediction. That's just a guarantee. And I'm not making any other predictions because, frankly, I don't want to give you guys any more bulletin board material than what. Well, hey, Seattle no, it's okay. Guys. Hey, who is this guy? Is this is this guy right here like one of y'all's favorite fans, Kevin Hyde? Kevin Hyde. Um, he says, Kevin yeah, Hyde. sadly, Houston's history isn't going to carry them through. He has been, man, he is he is all over our comments. I really, I, re- I 
Hey, I really hope he subscribed because he's given us a lot of views right now. Yeah. Um, hopefully, <laughs> hey, he I like it. There, there aren't there aren't too many uh, they they aren't too many uh, Mariners fans here in the chat. I've been watching it. I've been seeing you talk. I, I I'm making all the mental notes. I'm keeping the receipts, and uh, I'll see you, I'll see you guys next week. Right? I'll see you guys next <laughs> <Yeah>. week. <laughs> all right, um, guys. To close out the podcast, I I am gonna force y'all to make a prediction. Um, what do y'all see this series going? I still say Astros in four. It could go five though, but I, I'm going to stick with the Astros in four. Um, I think y'all going to win game three. I, I'm I might get crushed if if I don't pick the M's here. I'm just going to be real about it. I like. I'm just going to be honest. My gut says Astros in five. I think the Mariners do take them to five. Okay, but. Okay. I'm just going to say M's and five because it's fun to say M's and five. So M's and five. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we have that. We have that little clip now, so we can go ahead and put it <laughs> exactly. all over your Twitter. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. 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 <laughs> Hi, Brett. Um, can I, can I pull a Mark McGuire and plead the fifth here? Because I kind of gave our fans my no, you, word. You, you, ha- you have to do it. I did it. I did it. So you have to do it. I did it. So you have oh. to. Now I, I, I okay. went like the cheapest way possible to be fair. So I don't blame you if you also do that, but you have to make some okay. form of prediction here. Just say I I have a dream that it's going to be like this. I believe that if things go the way that the that I know that they're going to go or think they're going to go, that the Astros easily win games one and two. They lose game three and they clinch in Seattle in game four. That's just that's what my heart tells me. But does Seattle have the chance to push it to five and bring it back to Minute Maid? If they do, the Astros easily win game five at Minute Maid Park. Okay. All right. So you've heard it here on the Locked On Astros podcast. This is going to be an interesting series. No matter who wins, it's going to be definitely (laughs) an interesting matchup. So, um, Ty, once again, thank you for joining. Where can they find you on Twitter? And Tell us about your co-host and tell us about your YouTube channel. Yeah, so uh, I host the Locked On Mariners podcast. You can find us on YouTube at Locked On Mariners. You can find us on Twitter at LO underscore Mariners. And uh, you can find me at Dane Gonzalez, C A N E G N Z L Z. And uh, you can find my co host, Colby Patnode, who joins me every single day on the show. And we're going to be uh, doing a post game show after the game tomorrow. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at CPAT11. Uh, or control the zone. Uh, we also host a, uh, or we have a Patreon where we uh, do two more shows every single week. We do a lot of podcasts. We talk a lot about the <laughs> Seattle Mariners. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash control the zone. Check it out. And hey, guys, make sure that you stay tuned because this week, once we get the time for the Saturday game, game three, we'll let you know um, when the pregame live podcast is going to be at Hooters NASA. We're going to do that, and y'all can come out, hang out with us, and watch the Astros battle the Mariners in game three. And Ty's coming from Toronto to come watch that with us, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, after being in my own, you know, personal hell in Toronto, I might as well just you know, head down to Houston <laughs> as well. Just knock that off of my bucket list. I'm sure that'll be a great time. I would love, uh, you know, I would absolutely love to sit, you know, for three hours in the, in a crowd full of Astros fans telling me about how Scott Service is a big old meanie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we kind of tackled that. And let me tell you, it's it was it. it we avoided it in this podcast, though. We did. I had, I, I, had, I, had, I had numbers. I had numbers to back it up. Oh, I was there ready are for that. I, had, oh, no, I, I, was, I was. I was ready. I was ready to. I was ready to have that whole discussion. But let's do it some other time. Let's do. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it when when there let's isn't do it like after a whole, the series. Yeah. When, like, when there isn't a whole series and a lot of storylines to talk about. Let Let's have a discussion about that this off season. Let's do it. Okay. All right. All right. So got, that's all we got for this edition of the Locked On Astros and Locked On Mariners podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe to both of our channels. Make sure you make us your first listen on Apple, Odyssey, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. Make sure you check them out and do not uh, do not like that um, bobblehead right there. Um, check out all mine and back. So that's all we got, and we'll see you uh, tomorrow, hopefully after Astros victory and Ghostros.